hope that uh, we're going to have um, 30, 35 minutes of panel discussion and then followed up by a Q&A. So I hope you all have your questions ready to roll. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to have you fill out a lot of them. You'll be moderating, moderating the panel discussion. <laughs> I think she asked me to do this part of the panel process so I can keep my mouth shut, so. Anyway, for those of us who've been in the Bronx long enough, we understand that issues like, like get, gent gentrification are uh, a part of the whole exploited uh, process that exists here in our communities from outside forces. What we have here today, and what we hope, and it's always been uh, one of our hopes, is that the arts can help bridge that gap between the outsider and the community, and engage the community in a way that allows the voices from the community to be heard. We have four individuals here who are very strong professionals in their own right, who have distinguished themselves by their community activism, as well as their work here in the Bronx. And I would like each of them to introduce themselves and give a one minute bio of who they are. One minute, and I will count 60 seconds. Hi everyone, my name is Lauren Click. I am the Director of Community and Public Programs at the Bronx Museum of the Arts. Welcome and thank you so much for coming to this conversation. It's really important that we all get here and talk about these really interesting, very, very current topics. Um, I see, what was the, oh, yeah. Oh, so <laughs> for this topic, I think I see my own role as part of my title, but also that the Bronx Museum is, is in our mission, it says that we're the crossroads. And I see my role as bringing the genius and highlighting the genius that is here in the Bronx, the artists and the arts organizers, and highlighting those and then bringing in the highest quality artwork and exhibitions that we can from highlighting other uh, outside artists and art, uh, bringing it here into the Bronx so everybody can experience the best quality work that there is in the world. Good evening, everyone. My name is Linda Molina. I'm a Bronxite artist, um, arts and cultural producer, and currently um, I'm working in the public sector in Bronx Parks and Recreations as um, an organization known as <coughs> Partnerships for Parks, which is all about activating green public spaces um, in four districts in the Bronx. And um, I've had a very interesting career um, working in arts and cultural sector for a bit, working at the Bronx Council of the Arts, and before that working in private. So having the experience of working in those three sectors has helped me shape and understand working in the public sector, how it very important is engaging your local CBOs, your arts organizations, your community members, new immigrant migrant communities to activate with arts and culture as well as civic engagement. Because that's how I feel with that. That's how you can sustain communities in, with respect to gentrification. Thanks. Ms. Calderon. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Melissa Calderon, and I'm an artist. I'm from the Bronx. I'm currently living in exile in Brooklyn right now, but I hope <laughs> to be back very, very soon in the next month or so. Um, I'm an artist, but I also am the exhibition and residency coordinator at the Andrew Freeman Home, which is on Grand Concourse. Uh, we have for the past three years have been, uh, we have artist studios there as well as an, an exhibition as well as public art on the grounds. And we have a very specific mandate from our director, Walter Pergier, that we are to be, and something that we have worked together on, on creating is programming that is centered around social justice issues that are very important to the surrounding community. So all of our exhibitions and the artists that are there all work with topics that are very important to the community. And we work directly with the community uh, on Saturday programs, also in very many different ways, always free and always open to, to anybody who's willing and wanting to be a part of the process at Andrew Freeman. Um, I, again, I'm also an artist and I also work uh, in topics talking about history and memory as well as political topics that are important to me and important to the community as well. So thank you for having me here. And Ms. Carrie McLean. 
Hello, everybody. Welcome to WebCo and um, the Bronx Career Center. Oops. Um, so I am an immigrant from Jamaica, came here to the Bronx, um, left and came back. And you know, WebCo is a nonprofit community development organization that focuses on education, housing, um, uh, family support, and the arts, among other things, entrepreneurship. And we really see this conversation about uh, arts and gentrification as we all know as being very relevant to this time that we're in right now. You know, a lot of our and all of our programs are really about supporting families and helping them to thrive here in the Bronx, creating more equitable and economically vibrant places. And so, um, this conversation about the arts, being that we've you know been doing arts through our after-school programs and through the Bronx Music Heritage Center is really uh, critical to looking at the role that we can play in using arts as a tool uh, for community development. Thank you. And as Kate introduced me, I'm Bill Aguado, and I was the uh, director of the Bronx Council of Arts over 30 years, and I'm now the director, interim director of Enclopo, which is a photography organization that's been around for uh, over 40 years. Well, why don't we get to the real meat of this topic, Arts, the community, outside influences, how do we define gentrification within, uh, within the context of the arts, and how can the arts uh, bridge, uh, help the communities assert themselves? Lauren, you want to start, or anybody want to start? I think, um one of the things that we've really focused on through the Bronx Music Heritage Center, and even through our after school programs uh, that we do, which incorporate arts, is really to leverage and to channel the history. And like you said, we talked about memory of this place. The Bronx is so rich in culture and in the arts. And uh, too often, our young people don't know about that. Um, you know, many of us are immigrants, so we don't know about it because we don't necessarily see it in the spaces where we are. So we really. Um, made a concerted effort to be purposeful about incorporating the history of music and the arts in the Bronx into our programming, into our cultural programming, into our arts education, uh, and just our educational programs, period. So I think that's one of the ways, um, you know, that's important to channel what's already here as an asset uh, into, you know, the public sphere so that we are empowered as community members, knowing where our communities are coming from and also being informed where it's going. Melissa, can you talk about the Friedman home and how it bridges the gap between arts and community as well as being a catalyst for economic development from within the community? Absolutely. Um, the Andrew Friedman home, if anybody hasn't been there, it's across the street from the Bronx Museum and it's a huge mansion and it, I lived in the Bronx my whole life and when I drove past it probably my whole life I had no idea it was there and then I find out about three, four years ago that there's, it's a multi-purpose community uh, center that has ESL classes, has pre-K, has Head Start, but also in the past three years, uh, the director of Walter Perrier has decided to include uh, artist residencies for local artists. So we have right now 14 artists in residence and 90% of them are from the Bronx. We are very specific about making sure that we're supporting local artists that we're not looking from outside the Bronx to fill our artist studios. And like I said, we are all mandated with uh, being a part of Andrew Freeman as artists. We all have our studios for free. And part of our free studios is that we give 20 hours a month back to the community, whichever way is needed. And usually what that means is either workshops, classes, working with senior centers in the neighborhood. We also have practically a free Saturday studio program for any local kid that wants to come in and just learn arts. And we have very different types of art um, that we teach. Uh, one of the wonderful things also about the Andrew Freeman Home, because it's owned by Mid Bronx, Mid Bronx is a economic development uh, organization, a nonprofit that uh, has 28 buildings throughout the Bronx of low income housing. So we are dealing directly with people in the community who need uh, the services and also who want the services. A lot of the arts, a lot of the art education in the local schools doesn't exist anymore. So the artists volunteer their time every Saturday, even after school programs, to provide arts 
to, to the kids, and not just kids, we have a lot of teenagers that are coming through, and even adults. And one of the wonderful things also about Andrew Freeman, just as I continue a little more, uh, in the past year, uh, to further de the dedication to the local artists and the arts community here in the Bronx, we've developed something called the Bronx Artist Housing Initiative, where we are providing low-cost, rent-stabilized apartments for local artists uh, who want to stay in the Bronx, who find that their their economic situation or living situation is no longer viable for them. And we're providing these rent-stabilized apartments for people that just want to stay in the Bronx. And it also comes with 20-hour uh, community service as well. So for, I'm sorry, I get excited about that. That, that to me is like a very unique program because this is something that isn't happening and we're very proud of it here in the Bronx. give me a hook. Uh, you know, listen, uh, you know, I might want to apologize because what you say is very important and the importance of artists housing here in the borough has to do with artists of color, artists who live in the borough and have a place to live and work, which is, which is, I can't begin to say how important that is. Uh, Lauren, I want to talk, I want you to, to talk about First Fridays and how it, how the voices of the community are heard, how community engagement is uh, fostered and, and how and why and how the Bronx Museum is developing a, a different profile than most other uh, large cultural institutions. Oh yeah, and absolutely. Talk about identification as well. Okay. All the notes that you studied and then you... <laughs> I think I'll start with programming because it's really exciting for me at least. But um, so actually something to note is that about in 2012, we celebrated our 40th anniversary, and as part of that, we went free admission. And since then, we also simultaneously planted Board of Trees. We um, worked with all, in that year, worked with and continue to work with all 40, or 40 different schools here in the Bronx, either through um, having them visit, having them visit um, the museum or working with them continuously, having local Bronx teaching artists visiting the school and bringing them in to visit the museum. We also started the Community Advisory Council, and there are two members here tonight, actually. Hi, guys. Um, the Community Advisory Council, we meet once at the museum a month, and they advise us on programming, and they volunteer with us, and on marketing, and they actually, they really, I feel like I get my finger on the pulse of what's going on, um, and I have some examples, but I feel the hook. No, no, no. <laughs> what I want you to focus on is on the, the diversity of your first Friday program. Oh, yeah. That's really articulates and encourages the voice of the community, and unlike any other place, right? Well, thank you. So, we have a First Fridays program which we host once a month. Um, we partner. This is a good, like a good um, example of partnering with in both Bronx-based organizations and external organizations because we often partner with the Havana Film Festival or the African Film Festival, um, and then we also host um, local bands or local um, other local performers to perform at this First Fridays program. So if you come, it might be a, like a salsa band or it might be a jazz band, and it could be from outside the Bronx or inside the Bronx. But part of that is that. Or it might be The Moth, if, if anybody's uh, seen The Moth of Storytelling. And a lot of that is, we part of that, the idea is to bring people both from outside of the Bronx, but then also inside of the Bronx. I mean, traditionally at the museum's visitorship is 60% Bronx site, and the rest is like everywhere, anywhere. Um, and part of that is from our, our super, super diverse programming. Um, actually, if you don't mind if I plug, but on, on Friday we have a Bronx Stories program, which is another one of our longtime programs where we invite poets, storytellers, this time all from the Bronx, it's Bronx women. They come and they choose an artwork in the galleries, and not all of our artwork is, is Bronx-based artists, I'll be honest, but um, they will come and choose an artwork, they will write a story or a poem or a spoken word piece and perform it in front of the piece so it's Friday, if you want to come, it's free, as everything. But a lot of that is showcasing the incredible genius that we have here in the Bronx and showing it for free. So if you come, you will be able to see a 19-year-old, or you'll be able to see a, probably she doesn't want me to mention her, eight-year-old perform, in, inspired by the artworks that we have in the exhibition, and all showcasing people from the Bronx. Yeah, I want to get back to that in a second. Uh, Linda Bonilla, uh, one of the, the, the women on either side of me 
came to the Bronx Council in New York, I hired them to work in me. I must have inspired them so much that they left to become artists. They're sad to become artists. So, Thank you, Bill. Um, I guess with regards to um, gentrification, um, I think for me, working in the public sector now, my goal is activating with the local artists and independent artists, working groups, and agencies that I hadn't had the opportunity to, you know, that I stopped working at BCA, but now have an opportunity to engage them on a bigger public level, which is activating stewardship, activating ownership in waterfronts, playgrounds, parks, street trees, and green spaces, because that's a public realm, and that is a wonderful incubating space of local, for locals to show that they're here, they're invested, this is who, where they are from. Um, and as an arts and cultural producer, I feel that it's important that you want to keep local alive and you have to invest in the artists that live in your neighborhoods. And um, I feel that it's only like activating with agencies like Moya, the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, um, Department of Design, um, DOT, Department of Transportation, Department of Education, and it's all those agencies that don't really get the opportunity to really go in and figure out where artists are, where work teaching artists are. And as a public servant, I feel that I have the opportunity and the leverage to show where they are, or what pockets they reside, so that we don't have, I mean, as much as I love international art and national art, I feel that we need to express and really highlight the local artists and teaching artists that are here, that are invested, that are not planning to go anywhere. So um, that's, that's my shtick. <laughs> I want to get back to the project you were, you were talking about, uh, about the women uh, actually performing works, uh, which, which leads me to ask everyone is we talk about identifying artists, artists working in communities, arts organizations working with communities, uh, placing artists in the community. But at what point do we recognize that you recognize that there are artists in our community that do not self-identify as artists, but are extremely creative and have a legacy that frequently is is, is ignored by the established uh, 501c3s or funding sources in general, as well as lo local traditions that would not be funded, that not a five or one. So how do you engage that, how do you empower that as a way to strengthen the community as a voice for, not against, not against gentrification, but educating those who are come, coming into our community? I'll leave it up to whoever wants to chat first. It's, it's pretty much about being out there, being out in the field. Um, I have the opportunity to go out and just go on foot and you know, walk up to that storefront, go to that church, go to that, you know, interesting cultural center or that senior center that I know I've heard stuff is going on in a great way or that local community in Westchester Square that's, you know, Bengali. Like, how do you engage them? You have to look for their leaders. You have to look for their, you know, their leaders that, that are interested in connecting. Um, we're more diverse than ever. I think we're, you know, we're good competitor to Queens now with diversity. And, but the thing is we want to respect and welcome and the new people that are here, but it's really about just, you know, it's investing time, you know, that time to have people to go out on the pavement, to go on foot to meet those communities. Clearly, you want to take that a little further with your housing and, and, and local, uh, yeah, I think it goes back to actually your first question, which was about community engagement. Um, you know, a key part of what we do is we, exactly as you're saying, walk the streets, we survey people, we have community meetings. It's so important to understand um, and to know integrally the communities um, that you're working in to identify the different assets of the community. Mm -hmm. Some are artists, some are entrepreneurs, some are budding entrepreneurs, some are budding artists. And oftentimes people just don't have the stage or the place or, or have, you know, they don't have the opportunity to showcase their talents. Um, and so one of the things that we try to do is we try to bring it outdoors. So we'll close down, for example, this street, Louisiana Boulevard to traffic, and have two to three days, whether in the summertime, 
when we have activities that are, are you know, run across different themes that are of importance for communities, whether it be health or community workouts or dance, um, the arts are always a critical part of that. And through our partnerships with different organizations from Bronx Museum to, you know, Bronx Council of the Arts and, and Brock and the BMHC as well, the Bronx Music Heritage Center, people are able to engage in the arts um, themselves and showcase their talents um, in a non-threatening, you know, uh, kind of open to everyone kind of environment. Um, and we think that that's one way in which we're able to um, engage neighborhood residents would otherwise not find uh, a place to showcase their, their work that they have. I know, I feel like you guys have kind of spoken. And if I can just add one thing with the housing. So um, another aspect of our, of our work, so our next development, Bronx Commons, we're really purposeful um, about addressing some of the needs that we've heard, which are the housing for artists and housing for elder artists specifically. So our next development will have about 300 units of housing, an affordable housing development, Build Green, which will have housing for families, as well as about 15% of the units set aside for other artists. Just going back to everything that we've learned about the richness of music and arts and culture here in the Bronx, there's so many people who have contributed so much um, to music that has changed the world, and yet they're living in substandard conditions. And we think those are things that, um, as a nonprofit uh, community developer, that you know, we build housing like once every 10 years, we don't build very often. But we really see our buildings as catalysts for broader neighborhood development. And one of those things that we think is really important to do is to provide stable, safe, um, green, beautiful uh, places for people to live, including our artists. So that's one of the commitments that we've made um, to ensuring that artists from the Bronx and the Bronx are able to stay in the Bronx. Do any of you feel that the artists arts organization is sometimes placed in a position where they have to make choices between the funder, the sponsor, or the parent organization and the values of the local neighborhood, the values of the people in the community. And if that is the case, how can you resolve that? Or how can the artists resolve that? Or how can the artists be the broker for that? Any thoughts on that? Goldman Sachs wanted to come and uh, cut our trees, and we said no. <laughs> you know, I think I think it's the responsibility of, of an organization not to chase after money, but to make sure that the money that you're getting is from responsible places. And I feel like, especially with nonprofits, there's a lot of times the need to stay above water and making sure you have that grant money. But I also find that you know, when you have a despicable company like that willing to, uh, and wanting to, because they do. I mean, there are plenty, Coleman Sachs gives to River to River, which is a major uh, nonprofit uh, festival that happens in Manhattan every year. And they do this in order to make sure that, you know, they're, they're doing community work, you know, they're, they're, they're giving back in a way, and I feel like, this is the responsibility of, of organization heads to say, no, I, I will not accept this money. I will not take from, from the wrong places. I will not be beholden to people who do not share the values of my community or my organization. So I feel as though it is where it is very tight, but I also find that there have been amazing new funding sources as times have gone on uh, where more organizations are willing to give to communities or give to organizations that are doing more social justice work. And you see these grants coming up more often and I find that to be just a wonderful way for nonprofits to not feel like they're compromising their missions or their values to be able to stay afloat. Any comments on this side? Man, I just keep thinking, um, just wish we had some more money because yeah. I mean, Ultimately, um, I haven't I haven't really had the problem as far as programming of twisting into some kind of like Bacacta program that we wouldn't do normally. It's more that I'd like to pay people more. I would like to do more. I would like to <coughs> film programs. I would like to bring like bring in, for example, Arturo O'Farrell and have him do a forty piece band and have like a big show. And we just 
like finding the right funds for these things is just always sort of the the challenge that um, maybe when you say I want to give an artist a thousand dollars for writing that that song writing a song for us um, and they say like eh, you can give them two hundred it's like are you I mean why are you telling me how to value what somebody else like what how we value things like it's kind of like creating we need to create a minimum wage for performers and artists or some sort of like I mean I think it's the exploitative question that you're getting at like so do you do it and give them an honorarium? Or do you not do it? Or do you, um, I mean, it's always that, that horrible, horrible balance that I just wish there was more funds into actually supporting like these kind of like paying individuals instead of us paying lights, you know? Um, I would agree. Uh, working in the public sector, you know, there's a lot of, I landed a small grant that I was able to, to put in to use, uh, it's called Art in the Park series and it was the garden tours. And it was a modest amount, but being in the public, it, Partnerships for Parks, which is the agency I work for, is a public-private entity. So I was able to receive the money through the private part in order to pay the artists on the public part because I feel very strongly that no matter how <coughs> little or how big the event, you know, the artist should be paid. Um, it's, it's an art. Art should not be undervalued. But working in the public sector, you know, you working with different agencies or other entities that don't really understand the true value of working from a local aspect with local artists. And, you know, they wanted some, when I was working with the other program person that wanted to bring this artist in from outside, I was like, look, the mission of this series is to get local artists from the neighborhood. I don't want Fulana from, that performed in Central Park. That's not my, that's not the goal. So, you know, you have to really, it's about understanding core values and respecting the values and as, you know, and just trying to work that game. And um, hopefully, you know, let, let, you know, getting other foundations to understand that, you know. I guess being a public servant, you get to let them know, like, this is the, this is the board, the line that I can't cross. So, it's just, it's, yeah, it's ongoing. You know, it's, I'm, a, I'm, you know, the, the, one of the difficulties I have being a lad and I talk with my hands and, and so, so you hear half of what I'm saying because the other half is out here somewhere. So, so for that I do apologize. So, you know, you can focus. Uh, what I do want to talk about is each of you, I mean, I've known each of you for a number of years. Uh, and I've had a great deal of respect for what you've done and what your impact and commitment to arts in the community, community in the arts, and every sort, every way, you know. Uh, but I'm wondering if you ever consider the work that you do could become, a, a, could create a cultural infrastructure within the communities you serve that would allow them to create their own programming or come together to foster a thought, a legacy, uh, some sort of cultural experience, history. Have you, has said any, any of you have had that thought about creating infrastructure or infrastructure is the next step beyond what you're doing? Yes. <laughs> so, um, um, having the opportunity to work with four different community board districts in the Bronx and you get to see the, you know, the various, um, you know, each district has their own history, their own way of working things. Um, I, I have to say Hunts Point is one of the districts that I, that I caretake and I really, you know, it being under the, the guise and the eyes of development, um, I felt that it was extremely important to keep sustaining the, my, the access that I had to help keep community and culture and infrastructure is by activating parks and green streets. And, um, and it, but it's, like I said, it's all about meeting that person that hangs out at the store, who's at the rec center, that artist that comes to that cleanup event, you know, building stewardship. Those are the kind of things that I try to help create some sort of you know, baseline, and then helping, giving them leadership, or li letting them know about um, opportunities for them to build their group. And 
and whether it could be of some sort of civic engagement that entails with arts and cultural development as well. Uh, that's the type of thing that I try to do working in, in my, the position that I'm in. Well, one of the things at, um, at Andrew Freeman that's pretty unique is that we, even though Andrew Freeman's been around doing community work for about 20 years or so, more than 20 years, um, the Andrew Freeman Cultural Initiative, which is where I, where I work within the organization, is fairly new. And when I say that we have residencies, I mean, it sounds very, it's just visual artists, we're just sort of producing this high-end work. Um, we are community artists, and I say that because we have uh, Dr. Drum, who is a Bombay Glenna, uh, he, he does both ends of Bombay Glenna plus drumming, and we also have uh, other artists who are working locally. We have, um, actually we have DJ Cool Herc, who uh, needed a studio space and is with us. And the thing is, is that he needed some place where he can go and just be himself without being DJ Cool Herc. He needed a space where he can do what he needed to do. And we provided that for him. And what he does for us is he helps us understand how to get out to the community. He, he has his connections. And being able to bring people that already have those connections within the community to Andrew Freeman that then provides a venue for them to do community work is the model that we're going towards now, which I find to be really wonderful. Um, Dr. Drum, who I'm sure has performed here, he has flyers over there for his <laughs> events. He does events all around the community and he is amazing. He is our champion and I always hold him up to highest esteem because he was a Bronx drummer who just used to play right there at Fordham Plaza for 10 years. He would just bring his drums. You probably saw him if you waiting for the 12 bus. He was just sitting out there drumming and he wanted, and, and what he would do for work is he would go from school to school trying to figure out gig work. And, and Andrew Freeman, when he saw that there were studios available, here he was, he wasn't a visual artist. He wasn't doing just straight conceptual painting. He was a community artist activist and he needed space and we provided it for him free of charge. And he has grown exponentially because we have been able to do this. He has been able to sustain himself as an artist, be able to continue forward with his programming, which is very centered around senior citizens and children. So giving him the, the foundation so he could platform forward in however way he needs to was the most important thing for, for us at Andrew Freeman. And I hope that we continue to do that. And that's the type of artist that we look for. In our residency program, there's two aspects. You have to be a great artist, in whichever way. Like I said, it's not just visual artists because it is musicians. We have a group of musicians and we have, we have uh, designers who are also activists as well who use design to, to sort of get their social message out, message out there. So we feel artist is a very general term to include anybody who's, in, who's doing work in, in that way. In your community empowerment activities, community engagement, what, do you feel that political activism has uh, is one of the strategies that you will employ, should employ, or are employing? Anybody? Um, working when I worked at the Bronx Museum with Lauren, <laughs> um, was it was it 2014 when we did it? Um, so I was the arts and cultural producer at, for Boogie on the Boulevard, the inaugural year. Um, Boogie on the Boulevard is um, the concept of car-free Sundays for the center lanes of the Grand Concourse, and it was just under a mile. And curating that space, I felt that not only arts and culture should be, you know, key, but also having civic agencies, you know, allowed to table and to do workshops that speak about renters' rights, a registration, get registered to vote, um, knowing what to do during an emergency. I felt that that but having the civic engagement component to Book in the Boulevard was key to giving it a well-rounded, and also health as well. Health was also key. Um, those were the four elements that helped spawn and launch Boogie on the Boulevard and still continues, as Lon could say. Well, yeah, absolutely. And it's the last Sundays of the, of the summer months, if y'all want to come. It's very similar to their outdoor festival. They're both a lot of fun. But this is just um, something that isn't necessarily arts related, but more 
infrastructure related is that the museum has event spaces. And something we do is that if you are a nonprofit institution and you're hosting an event that's free and open to the public, you can host one free event a year. So Partners for Parks does that. Um, but we also have, um, you know, the Bronx for President will host a housing event there, or Bronx 200 will host their opening. Bronx 200 is an amazing online website that has 200 Bronx-based artists that they showcase, so you can easily like find cool Bronx artists. But they hosted their opening event there. Bronx Arts Factory hosted their opening event, another small um, local arts institution. So, I mean, it's not necessarily us. It's more opening our doors to these organizations that don't have space yet and don't have maybe even the money but we are giving them this opportunity to use our space and and invite people in you know, to incubate change and political you know quietly political you know activating and getting people they weren't quiet yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> that's okay but that's key and i want to add to it sounds like we're doing a lot of um similar things in that we've identified what some of the needs are um and the opportunities for responding to needs of artists. Our next development, as I mentioned, Bronx Commons will have uh, the permanent space of the Bronx Music Heritage Center. So this is the Bronx Music Heritage Center lab that we're in. It's our satellite space. And the Bronx Music Heritage Center will be 10 times as big as this. It will be 15,000 square feet of space. And it's specifically to provide infrastructure for artists uh, and communities to engage uh, around the arts and around Bronx music and Bronx arts in particular. So we'll have a recording studio, performing space, rehearsal rooms, dance studio. Uh, you know, we expect to have some kind of tech space as well, but it's all about providing the infrastructure so that everything that we're talking about in terms of culture, arts, and really building capacity within our communities um, for the arts to thrive, and really for the arts to be a tool, uh, one of the tools in the toolbox for human development, that there is that space. Um, this space, for example, is available for um, reservation by artists and by arts organizations and individuals who want it as well, because it is one of those areas that it's so expensive to find a portable space, you know, to rehearse, to dance, to have classes, etc. So that's one of the things that we knew from the very beginning, we need to make available and make available here. And in response to the question about being civically engaged, well, that's just critical. Our communities have been voiceless for so long, um, and there's such an opportunity uh, now, you know, we really see our role as um, providing spaces for the community to connect with those who represent them, for the agencies that impact their communities, whether it be the Department of Transportation and Lighting in the neighborhood, or um, you know, the MTA and the train tracks, or the mm -hmm. frequency of trains, all of those things, which too often our communities have not been heard. Um, and so a key part of our role has really been to encourage people to register to vote. We do that every time, you know, there's an opportunity to register with a registration time. And also just encouraging people to go to their community work meetings or having community planning meetings and community vision meetings here where we bring the agencies to the table, we bring the commissioners of the departments of transportation and the NYP to the table. So they can really hear directly from communities about what, you know, quality of life issues are affecting them and how you know, there really needs to be a, a collaboration between those agencies, elected officials, and community members in order to be the right solution. And the arts definitely deserve all of that. Um, yeah, that um, well, like I said, we're, we're sort of, Andrew Group is sort of new doing cultural um, programming, but we, we have that mission to engage in social justice ideas and concepts. Uh, and if you came to Andy Freeman today, you would see that uh, we have two exhibitions up right now. One of them is called the, the Apache Line. And the Apache Line is all about the Bronx. Uh, the curator, Walter Pierre, who's also our director and is also a budding curator, uh, decided to go with uh, the Apache Line because the Apache Line historically was if you were to be initiated into a gang or if you wanted to leave a gang, you had to run down this sort of uh, line of people beating you up and if you were able to get out to the other side you could either be a part of the gang or not be a part of the gang depending <coughs> on where you wanted and the idea that our neighborhoods are being economically hazed is a huge issue especially because his organization well our organization um owns also 28 other buildings that are low-income housing so we're actually 
watching and seeing how the gentrification is affecting our immediate neighbors. And we wanted to do an exhibition and we wanted to do programming that was speaking to the community about the issues that the community is feeling. And that was a very important, and when him and I were discussing this, we, were, we said, yes, this is, this is something that has always been our conversation, something that we're always discussing, and this was something that we decided that we were gonna go full throttle and supporting and being able to give the community a voice and, and having them just create art that they can uh, that they can see is a part of their struggle. Because I feel like a part of the arts in public art and gentrification is that people feel like this is not for me. This is for other people. This is for the new people that are moving into my community. This is for the, the people that are gonna come from Brooklyn or from Queens or Manhattan, and they're gonna come and see this, but this art is not for me in my community. And that's where we draw our line. We feel that what we put in our galleries is speaks directly to the community and we will always have that mission, that it will reflect what the community feels and, and that's something that we will continue going forward doing. So, and like I said, as far as including the spaces and the residency spaces, that's also part of the mission as well. People who give right back to the community, so. When we talk about artists and uh, uh, being in the community, being engaged with the community, and we talk about artists working for institutions, let's talk about artists for artists sake. Let's talk about artists as what their needs are within the community and what networking opportunity that would help them. That would help them in their own professional development, or or just their engagement of uh, a more profound engagement within their neighborhoods. So, well, so uh, the Bronx Museum is now celebrating its 36th year of hosting a program called Artist in the Marketplace AIM. Um, it's an incredible. You are an AIM artist, right? Not yet. <laughs> Were you in the Yes. Yeah. yeah. So maybe she can talk about it. Okay, go ahead. No. <laughs> you can talk about the lived experience, but um, the AIM program specifically, we get about 900 applications a year. We take 36 of those. Um, we do favor Bronx-based artists, and uh, but it's all New York-based artists, and they meet once a week. They get trained on how to write a resume, how to find a gallery, how to, and then they network within each other. They visit each other's studios. And we have a biennial exhibition every two years of those works. And the next one is this summer. They are, it is, it's incredible. Please, please come to these exhibitions. They're so cool. Um, and all the artists are there, which is I think one of the cool things about being in the Bronx is that with these lived artists making art and being here that you're meeting people. This isn't something that you're, you're from 200 years ago. Like you can talk to these artists that are sitting here with me. Um, Anyway, so maybe, do you want to talk about what it was to be like in the program? Because I haven't, unfortunately, been in it. No, <laughs> she more Bronx artists. Um, no, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, it, it really opened my eyes to the, the different types of work that people create. And it was one of the first artist experiences that I had just outside of just being in the Bronx and meeting local artists. It was sort of, it opened me up to sort of a larger view of the art world. Um, and it also gave me uh, a way as an artist to see that uh, the work I create and the work that I make uh, really needs to reflect not only my own personal concerns and issues, but also the, the issues of the community that's around me. Um, a lot of art is strictly for art's sake, which I think is just fine, but for me, I feel as though art needs to have, needs to say something, and it needs to say more than just, hey, I'm beautiful, pull me over your couch. Um, I feel very strongly about the work that gets created having meaning, and especially meaning for which the art can't speak for a community, can speak for people that maybe whose voices are not being heard at this moment. Which, if I have a moment to tell a story, I'd love to be able to tell a story when I get a chance. Okay. If Bill allows me to. <laughs> well, I find this to be, I, I feel like this, I had thought about telling this story just really quick because I feel like it's one of these things that, um, one thing we haven't really touched upon right now is how artists and gentrification are hand in hand, which I feel like is a huge issue. And I feel like artists should uh, own up to that. I feel like, yes, yes, we are a part of the problem and you should say so. Because 
It's important for you to admit as an artist that by moving into a certain neighborhood, if you are a certain color, and not even just color, if you, if you are of a certain economic level and you are moving into a neighborhood that is not of your economic level, obviously, you need to own up to the fact that you are then changing the face of the community. Now, how do you fix that? How do you use what you do as an artist to be able to explain, okay, this is, this is who I am, but I'm going to use my art to talk about the issues that, that, that are being faced. I, I, I just want you to follow up with a couple more yes. minutes before a paint spills the words, you know, I need to come now. Early Mark Asian, yes. when you were such a force, one of the forces within early Mark Asian, yeah. as when you worked at, as you worked for us, and how the networking occurred, and how that difference what do you see today versus? Back, I, I lived in Mount Haven in 2005, from about 2002 to about 2006, uh, which was really early considering. I, I had moved from the North Bronx where I had grown up, and I moved down to the South Bronx, and I lived right there on Bruckner Boulevard, which was really amazing, and I was able to afford it. And in 2005 uh, was when the community board decided that they were gonna begin rezoning the Mod Haven neighborhood to what we see today. And what they had said to us, and I was talking about it earlier, was that within 10 years of 2005 was when they expected Mod Haven to be booming, which is right now, 2015, here we go. And here we have the changes that we have seen. Now a group of us, Mothers on the Move, Working Families, a group of artists called the Coalition of Mod Haven Artists who had just moved down to that neighborhood. And it just, and that just included uh, people who were influxing from other parts of the city, but a group of Bronx artists who had moved to Mount Haven to be a part of that community, we all got together and learned our political lesson that we were trying to make sure that there were affordable housing clauses in any new developments that were gonna be happening in Mount Haven, Port Morris. And we were told by Carmen Arroyo, thank God she's gone, uh, that she was going to fight for us and that she was going to fight for the affordable housing clauses and of course she didn't and now we see now what's happening. You see all everything, that new coffee shop that's in Mount Haven and you see all the expensive housing where they're building an indoor pool down there now which I can't even believe but you see the changes now and what I say is that this was 10 years ago and people are fighting now for the changes that, oh my God, look what's happening in Mount Haven, the Bronx is not for sale. We need people to see the forethought. If that happened 10 years ago, what's happening to this neighborhood now? You know, like the, the rezoning, we have to be get ahead of the rezoning to make sure that we could then fight the fight of getting affordable housing clauses. Because this, and, and we all, we try really hard. Everybody believe, we try to go to those meetings when they have those local planning meetings and people show up. I think that that's where we need to show more of a presence because I eventually, and this was part of my, my story that I was talking about. Here I was, I was an artist, I was a Latina artist, and I moved down to the Bronx where I was from, and because I was there with a group of 20 other people and the landlords who had been sitting on these properties since the 70s, finally saw that their time was coming to cash in, I got kicked out. So did the rest of the artists, the first wave that came through. I and mean, this is like the 10th wave now of people who come to my haven, can't afford to stay because greedy landlords. And you think about that. Now, I'm talking specifically from an artist standpoint, but imagine, an immigrant family wanting to move into that neighborhood, which is historically an immigrant neighborhood, trying to afford that neighborhood now, and they can't. And I find that to be the most despicable thing because here I was. I was a part of my own gentrification. I fucked myself, dare I say, by being there, and now I couldn't afford it, and I had to leave. And I feel like this is when I say that artists need to take responsibility for what they do in a community. That's what I say. Because that to me was like, that was my wake up call, is that, you know what, you are a part of the problem, Alyssa, but now how do you fix that? Then I began to create work that, that talked about it. I created a piece called Blanc Blanco, which I did in Red Hook, which was for the Puerto Rican community about the ever-changing neighborhood that they were going through. And I essentially 
went through that neighborhood, saw that the Puerto Rican community was going through this crazy gentrification and how they were being marginalized, and I decided I was gonna do a performance piece. When we're talking about public art and gentrification, this was something I decided I was gonna do. I was gonna do it in Mount Haven, but when I was in Red Hook, I decided I was gonna do it there. And I decided I was gonna do a new performance where I was gonna carry 100 pounds of flour on my body and just spread it all through the building as much as I can all through the outside, and I did this because I wanted the community to know that I was listening to them. Because as we were walking through that neighborhood and I was going through that neighborhood, I saw the looks that I got. Oh, you're part of the problem. You're the part of the problem. You're the people who are raising my rent. And I'm like, you know what? I did it to myself too. And this is my punishment and I'm gonna be a part, I'm gonna create work that's a part of that. And I feel like that that's the most necessary, most needed thing. When I, I got put into the Bronx, uh, the Bronx Courthouse exhibition that No Longer Empty did, which was a big problem. A lot of people in the neighborhood had issues with it. And I understand the issues. But what I did was I took the opportunity that was given to me and I created work about the Bronx. And I created work about revitalization and what the cost of revitalization is, whether it's the, I did a piece about the Bronx River, I did a piece about the South Bronx Gold Rush, which I find to be exactly what's happening when you have these landlords and developers just looking to buy any property that they can and literally marginalizing the people that have been here forever. And I feel like that that is the most necessary thing is that artists who are creating work in the community continue to make work that talks about the community and speaks about the issues that are important to them. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> With that, uh, we're not ending, but we're gonna turn this over to uh, our audience, do you have any questions? Uh, oh, we turn it back to uh, Ms. Calderon. <laughs> I apologize. I feel, this is something that I feel very strongly about, and I feel very strong about creating art in this sense, so I apologize for my stealing too long. Questions? Anyone? Uh, okay. Okay. No, everybody's satisfied. Okay. Some of the stuff, right? Yes. You spoke a little bit about being able to say no when you were asked, your organization was asked to cut down the tree, yes. right? Yes. How do you think we can increase that throughout the borough, that integrity, to be able to have the power to say no, despite coming and struggling with poverty and a lack of resources? What do you think we can do as a community to spread that, to increase that power, that empowerment of saying no? And where did you get it from? <laughs> Well, you know, I, I get it. I, I probably have a little bit of rub, rub off from this this guy right here, who was my executive director for five years. He's a who's been a badass in in the art community. But I also get it from my executive director Walter Perrier because he feels just as strongly about these issues as I do. So having somebody of leadership who's who also I work with who feels the same makes make, is also uh, helps in saying. No, you, you, uh, we're not gonna take your money. And I have to, and like I said, I understand the need to be able to have programming. Yeah. But I also feel as though mm -hmm. there are different ways to handle that in that sense though. And I know that this sounds very cliche, but you know, the coming together of different resources from different community organizations and sort of self-sufficiency and sustainability, I feel like a lot of times, a lot of Bronx organizations have lots of different resources that maybe are not being used all together. And I think about like, let's just say tree planting, and I think about Harry Bubbins at, at Friends for Brook Park, and I think about how, I bet you Harry's probably got away. And I feel like knowing the resources, and, and since the Bronx is so spread out in the sense that a lot of places are very different, I feel like if there was a, a network, uh, oh, like way, you can't wait for anyone else to say no. You have to step up and say no. You can't wait. Mm -hmm. But how do we kind of institutionalize that across the Bronx? I, I think that a part of it has been, you know, I came out of the 60s and 70s when heavily in the Antonetti, right, United Bronx Parents, was the strongest advocate for education and community empowerment. And she went to straight to the, uh, to the city hall and yeah. said no and brought people together to say, no, you can't wait. You have to step up and, and your feelings may get hurt and your funding may be cut and you may be threatened. And I know there's a, 
this area was not allowed to come in because of my, I was given uh, by Ramon Velas, I was told in no uncertain terms, you step over this borderline, you're dead. And I believed him. On the other hand, he could not stop me from voicing my opinion. The question is, why do we have to follow the rules? There are no rules. We make our rules in, in, in community engagement. We take it over. And that's what Harry Buffett does. That's what we did when the party uh, that took place down there, Harry Buffett and, and Michael Smith from uh, South Bronx United, Johnson. We met with the we we, we, we met with that with, with that developer who the party, and we actually he said, "Well, I mean, you know, he wanted us to do an exhibit." And I said. I was. I said, well, what, "Do you have the balls for someone to put on that sign that you that that, that you uh, made that obnoxious statement about uh, the piano district? Yeah, the, the piano district to just say that you're full of shit and you would underwrite it." And he looked at me and said, "I'll do it." So, but was that engagement with right up in in his face? You've got to do it. I know that I'll turn it over to the others here. No, it, the key is getting involved with those agencies that we've ignored for a very long time and getting them to stand up and just facing them. I mean, I, being in the nonprofit sector for a while, you know, I was like, why are we not getting in touch with, why are these agencies like, everybody was working in silos. Yeah. And I think the only thing was is to get inside the agency. And I actually have known, I've met other artists who are working in different agencies, civic agencies, and it's about learning the system. And I know for me, as an artist in my practice, you know, as, as you know, it's very personal to me, but having, connecting it with community, and the only way to understand and help share this information is by, you know, for me was to learn the system, understanding parks, understanding the system. And with that, learning that it's open, it's free, it's public. But there are these weird civic agency rules. It's about learning the game and turning it to your advantage. That's the only way I see how artists, work groups, you know, collaboratives and collectives can organize to mobilize and to create the change. Saying, I know that. I was like, I know these rules, and here's my permit. So there you go. You know, it's doing little things like that. Booking on the Boulevard was an incubating space for civic engagement because a lot of these agencies wanted the platform to do it, to get engaged with our communities. So I was like, well, let's publicize this in six languages and let everybody know their mother that we can access these, these agencies that never, that are in downtown all the way down and let them come up here and understand like, this is Fulana, this is Fulano, this is Habibi, and like, this is who you are. This is your community. You you know, and that's that was the way I felt like that was the way to break that border, that boundary of like agency, you know, that people didn't have to stand online. They can go in and that I felt like doing that kind of incubating for civic engagement is key. Like cult, you know, cultivating those kind of things. And if I can just add I was just going to add collaborating across sectors yes. is also critical. Correct. So sometimes we get really siloed, like if you're an artist organization or an arts organization, you're just like communicating with arts, other arts organizations. Like it's so critical for any community change, whether it be about housing or about parks. lighting or safety or parks or anything, that you are collaborating with other organizations that are not like you. Because they have a different angle, a different perspective, or a different, you know, sometimes hub, a different level of experience with whoever it is that you're trying to, you know, influence to make a decision that's your way. So a community development organization partnering with an arts organization, also partnering with a health organization, mm -hmm. also partnering with a transportation, you know, it's, yeah. it's really, they, they, they really can't um, fight all of you at the same time. They're strength in numbers. Yep. And so going at it individually doesn't work as well as really collaborating as a collective and then also cross cultural I mean, I think, are we answering your question? That's my only, I mean, this is amazing, and I'm like, I, it's amazing, I just want to be sure that we're getting at what you want to get at, yeah? Because I think part of this concern is like turning down, I mean, I think the way that we're saying it, at least um, at this point, is like what, what Bill is saying, like, you should say that you're moving in here and you're full of shit, however, <laughs> you should put artist housing into your housing. Like if we have to deal with it, then we have to at least 
push, right? We have to uh, ask and work and that they that they work with us, that we are, not, they're not moving into a void. It's not a blank space. Mm -hmm. So if, if there is, however we can get the foot in the door and say, hey, can you create a gallery space in the bottom of your, of whatever the hell you're building that we can't <laughs> contend with, right? I mean, I'm not in the, the housing business and you can probably explain this a lot better, but a lot of it is like putting your, or the way at least I see the arts in that is in like fighting and ensuring that they are including it, that they're including space within their, whatever that they're building to have us in it. Some people who appear to be evil and enemies can in fact turn out to be champions and supporters and carry your message better than you could ever carry it. And so sometimes it's important to actually have dialogues with people at different levels within the organization because you're coming at it from different perspectives, but in fact there might be common ground. Well, you know, it's the one the one time, the one area where your voice can be heard and it, and especially if it's, a, if it's a diverse group of people, it's budget time mm -hmm. uh, towards the end of the bill, usually on a Saturday or, or on a June, th June 29th, June 30th, they're all sitting there getting the last pennies. Penny you, <laughs> you go down to City Hall at 8 a.m. in the morning when they're coming in and they see you with a couple of artists and with a couple of daycare people and a couple of housing, supervised housing people, all with the same voice, they're gonna say, wait a minute. And we're gonna say, we know how you're gonna vote and we're gonna make sure we're gonna hold you accountable. And you better believe they listen, because they listen at the most critical time when you're there, when they are trying to negotiate their own and to feed their own people and their, and, uh, at their own pockets, you're there to say, I'm one of the pockets you need to pass because you got to support our community programs. Another question? Thank you. Let's see, with two hands back there. Uh, can you please stand up so I can see who? Yeah, you. Yes. <laughs> um, I just wonder what did you think of the Thomas Hirschhorn to the French? What did you think of the Thomas Hirschhorn? What? The French. Monument a couple of years ago at the Forest House that the uh, Dia sponsored. Did they both in the middle? Did they both in the middle? Yeah. 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 And then there's a little bit of monument that had the studio and the radio, the computer line. Yeah, yeah. And my computer lab. It was like pretty much a t-shirt phone. Did you guys get the one? Yeah, he, I, he also created a book afterwards that documented how the whole process sounds a lot like some of the things you've been talking about. You know, you know right this right. was a famous Swiss artist mm -hmm. right. oh. who brought down the middle of the Bronx yes. and did this. Yes. Yes. So I, 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 I had a Belgian artist that wanted to flood a building. I eventually sent him to, I got a friend to do it in, in Staten Island. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it's very tricky. I don't you know, you may find this hard to believe, but there are a lot of artwork I don't like, a lot of art projects I don't like. There's a lot of, and there's a lot of bad art out there. And that may not, not, not my style, it's just bad art. <laughs> On the other hand, I will never tamper with the opportunity, with the right of an artist to showcase his work. When we had uh, Chris, uh, what's his name, going to Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Museum? Chris uh, O'Feely. Chris O'Feely. And Mayor Giuliani wanted to <coughs> have the Bro uh, Brooklyn Museum take it down. This was the saddest moment in the history of arts and culture in the city. There were only six of us that signed uh, that amicus brief in support of the Bronx Museum. Brooklyn Museum. Um, sorry, the, the Brooklyn Museum. And the Speaker of the Assembly of the, of the City Council, at the time, a strong Catholic, a very religious Catholic, would not compromise 
his religion, uh, the right of free speech because he was a Catholic and was turned off by, uh, by, by Chris's work. To me, is we, we cannot even begin to censor any one or any voice or any art form. They have to have a voice. I may not like it, I may tell them they're full of shit, I may walk out, but I will never ever tell someone they cannot show. And it's, even if it's not related to the community, not relevant to the community, if they, if they follow the process and, and are part of and do the work, that's, that's, I would be supportive in so far as have the right to do it. Preach. Huh? <laughs> Preach. But I think the reason that he brought this up is that the project was right in the middle of a um, low-income housing development and it was literally constructed and there was a cafe but it was like constructed out of paper and there was a computer and so the whole Bronx Museum actually went to go visit it like the, the staff and the, um, the impression I got which I totally agree with Bill about permitting to permit to permit because do not stop that. I don't actually, I don't even think you can stop art, artists in creating. Am I right? Artists on the panel? God. But um, the, I thought that the idea of, that the ideas around it were kind of insulting, but the people there, like the kids running the radio um, and the kids in the Gramsci library were really into it. And I feel like there was kind of a, a heady level where it was really interesting and then there was like the people that are like the hell is this and then under that was like the people experiencing it and the kids that have no idea what's going on and they were like really really into it so there is this i think it's super contextual but it's also like each person is going to take something different from it and i i see the problem with it but i also saw people really enjoying it and like running like learning about gramsci and running a gramsci like you're like oh my god you know, there, 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 was another, there was another case in the 1980s, John Azar, who does body cast, created a sculpture on, of Jerome Avenue. They're currently on view at the Bronx Museum if you want to go see something. Of, of, this, <laughs> uh, of this young black man with a boombox on, on his shoulder. And only two people in the community, two members of the planning board, were outspoken against it. Uh, they and John was who I mean, worked with the community. And John is one an artist who's constantly part of the community, engaged the community. And these two people got their way. We had a screaming match because they felt that this was insulting the community. And what John did was an image of the community that they wanted. Now, was there a right answer to this, a wrong answer to this? John eventually took it down, he was very hurt by it. On the other hand, I felt very strongly that this was a voice that needed to be heard, is that people were engaged in a dialogue, and the dialogue ended the moment the piece was taken down. So with the vice president of, uh, complained about the Vito Akanji mural on 61st Street subway. He called me up and asked me what my position was going to be. I told him to shut up and leave it alone. <laughs> uh, you know, it's right or wrong, there's an element that allows us to in initiate a dialogue. And it's a dialogue where people are going to both sides need to be heard. And that's the beauty of art. Once that engages people uh, in, a, in a dialogue, it's, it's, it, it's very powerful. And it's very, and it's a type of, and a type of experience that we're, many people who are involved will never forget. And, and I think that um, here in the Bronx, there is such an opportunity, and it's already happening for art, 
not just to be a product, but to be a process, you know, like a part of a process of community engagement, a part of a process of responding to community needs, a part of a process of, it, of sparking conversation, of bringing something new or different that people haven't necessarily seen in that way, shape, or form before, but that they connect with on some level. Um, you know, the Boogie Down booth, for example, that installation which we've done that combines design with music from artists from the Bronx of different genres, from the Earth Banana music that, as Elena will say, as a core artistic director, like you wouldn't hear Earth Banana music when you turn on the radio, but you hear it in the Bronx because we have the largest population of Earth Banana uh, peoples outside of Central America. You know, so it's a really great opportunity to use the arts as a way to communicate history and memory and pride, and also to, um, you know, to talk about the things that are of concern to community members or things that they want to see highlighted. So we have a second boogie down booth now at 174th Street on Southern Boulevard, just us here. It's bright, it's pink, it features, Elena, how many artists? So 17 artists from the Bronx, so, you know, there's a, we connected to the merchants on the boulevard as well because we, we see it as an opportunity to really um, spark good traffic to the neighborhood and thus to the, the <coughs> stores, the mom and pops that are like struggling to keep their doors open. Um, and so that opportunity is really en enabled more conversation about the park and the yeah. parks department, you know, joined with us and agreed to have us, you know, affix this booking on booth along the park side, which is, uh, uh, it's gonna have major capital improvements yes. this year. Yes. And they have told us that it's been a really great way for them to engage community around what people wanna see in the park that's behind it. In addition to finding about, uh, more about not music in the Bronx, when we had the Boogie Down Booth, the first one here at Freeman Street, we heard a lot of people talk about elevators and the need for an elevator and escalator, you know, to go up to the train, because I'm sure many of you who took the um, train today, you had to walk down like three flights of steps just to get to the bottom. Imagine all the elders in our community, you know, families who moved into our building and other buildings around with strollers. How are they getting to the train? They have to lift that up three flights of steps. And so, you know, there's an opportunity for the arts, for design to really, you know, create these spaces for community conversation and, and for activism as well around those conversations that respond to community needs. I mean, the other thing you want to consider is the disparity of funding between artists of color and mainstream artists, non-artists of color. And within that artists of color category, the major disparity was women of color getting funding, getting support, getting residencies, and uh, male artists of color. And there's a lot of issues uh, that our own community has to begin, has, has begin to address. Any other questions? So, uh, uh, much earlier in the evening, you talked about the need for affordable housing for artists, and as well, community space in basements uh, of those same buildings. And what makes me think about art space in, in East Harlem now. East Harlem has many things, but it's a lot different than it was 25 years ago. I don't want to blame art space for changing East Harlem, but this is an example of workspace in a quickly gentrifying neighborhood, one can say that there's a correlation between those two. So as great as artist housing is, is there a danger in creating affordable artist housing? Is it a harbinger of doom? Uh. <laughs> uh, from what I understand about art space is that they selected very few artists from that community to be in that building. So you had the market rate, and then you had the artist housing, and I think very few from the local community. So that to me is the biggest issue, is that it's not so much that the space was created, because we're not gonna be able to stop the growth. It's a matter of how do we manage to, to make sure that it works for the community. But I think that if we're able to do it responsibly from the very beginning, you know, one of the, the saddest things about that, that about art space was that, what was it, 55,000 people applied for 84 houses, 84 spaces? I mean, this just goes to show the inherent problem that we're having with housing in, in, in New York City. So the way I see it is that, you know, as far as for us at Andrew Freeman with the Bronx Artist Housing Initiative, we don't even have a lot of applicants. You would think that we would have a whole lot of people banging on our door, you know, especially because we have our mission to strictly, like I said, 90% provide housing to Bronx artists, 
but we don't have the critical mass that's, you know, hey, I need space, you know? Yes, it's open to other people, but we are really making sure that the local artists who are here can stay here. So spread that word out there. We have a lot of apartments for, for local artists so they can stay here and continue to support the community. Because like I said, there's 20 hours that they have to do in order to keep their rent stabilized apartment indefinitely. This is a rent stabilized indefinite apartment. So, and it's to give back into the community, which is sort of this wonderful okay. aspect. I want Carrie to talk about Bronx Music Heritage, the house, and the older, older musicians. But in answer to that project, the sponsors of it, the ones who develop it, uh, they have one of the worst reputations nationally. So I'm waiting to see. I'm waiting to see the other, uh, the other two drops uh, to see what's going to happen, how it turns into market rate, how it turns into beyond market rate, and goes up. I guarantee you, in less than 10 years, that's going to happen. Carrie, you want to talk about? Yes. So, uh, Bronx Commons, as I mentioned before, we'll have about 15% or about 40 units there, about 40, 45 units specifically for elder artists, elder musicians, really, artists, uh, who we're targeting for this. And it's because, as mentioned, they're getting pushed out of where they are. I mean, they need housing, just like everybody else. They're a part of the community. They're not coming in from anywhere. They live here, they're already here. They just need safe, affordable housing where they can live and work and sustain their livelihoods. You know, like a lot of musicians are in places where they can't play their instruments because they get you know, people tell the police, or, or, you know, so we want them to be able to, as they age, be able to still, you know, fulfill their passions, and to be able, with the Bronx Music Heritage Center on site, be able to pass on those passions, pass on those skills, you know, even master classes at the Bronx Music Heritage Center. So we really see that's responding to an, a current need. It's not, you know, uh, the Bronx, you know, our median income is like 33, uh, how, how much ever it is, it's low. And there are affordable housing is really to target those people. You know, it's really to target people who would otherwise not be able to find anywhere else to live. Um, so it's creating opportunities for artists who are here in the Bronx who need housing, not necessarily bringing artists or people from beyond. In 1982, uh, in the Bronx Museum was the community sponsor of this, Mayor Koch introduced artist housing, one, uh, one building to be developed in each borough. The restrictions and the qualifications were so strenuous that only one artist qualified here in the Bronx, and I think it was just north of 157th Street on the on the east side of the concourse. And in the other boroughs, they just quickly returned it to uh, yeah. I think that's sad. Um, so there's really interesting, in, in researching for this panel, there's really interesting research out of the University of Houston, and this is kind of a long shot, but I promise it relates to what you're talking about. But on a, on a national scale, they found that um, cities that have, make sure I get this right, fine arts institutions, so BCA, who was in the Bronx in 61, the museum who was here in 71, I mean, all of these institutions popping up that are here for the long haul, um, the Bronx, um, Bronx High School for the Visual Arts, fine arts institutions, nonprofits, museums, galleries that are supporting local artists and art makers. Those uh, communities that have those um, institutions, they revitalize and they, they um, the property values go up, but all together there's less gentrification, out, like out movement, displacement of people, there's less out movement, there's more of like a growth of the community together. And then in places where they found um, commercial institutions, so filmmaking or music making, not necessarily the same what we're referring to, but like commercial outside institutions coming in, filming, those are the places where they saw, they correlated a lot more uh, gentrification. So you're actually talking about like a diff, like different groups of supporters, like we are supporting the community growth and discussion and sustainability. sustainability. And there are other institutions and organizations that align more with developers. And, and I think that's um, something interesting to think about at least that relates to that piece where um, if they're not supporting local, then that's what you get. Yeah. In, in a borough county of 1.4 million people, 
and God knows how many others beyond that, uh, you have to believe that at least 10% of that population is about 140,000 are involved in the creative process on some level. And so the challenge we have is that we who are part of the, the contemporary art universe and the 501c3 arts universe and the institutional universe and, and the, the artist universe only make up a small portion of the creative members of our community. And the challenge for us is how do we recognize them and how do we encourage them to be, to, to have their voice be heard? How do we turn around and to our cultures, our, the legacies from, from, from from the islands, from the Caribbean, from down south, from, uh, from Africa, West Africa, from Europe. How many of them work privately, sustain our legacies quietly with various creative endeavors? And we know very little about it, and yet they are so extremely important to what makes our communities livable and why we're fighting this chain, the, the abuse of, the, I mean, gentrification will happen, it's the abuse of gentrification, of course the people are but we don't want to see, but yet we have over 100,000 people who are, whose voices are heard intimately in their building, in their block, in their apartment, or that sort of beyond that. And I think as we were talking about earlier before the panel started, like a part of it is art, but the community isn't about art in New York City, it's about housing. And support of, it's about affordable housing. And how can we sustain people in place? How can this city, which has like a 2% vacancy rate or whatever it is now, you know, provide the mechanisms, have the policies in place so that people through rezonings and, you know, other uh, mechanisms don't get displaced so that businesses do have options. Really it's about, you know, instead of yanking subsidy dollars from nonprofit developers to build, um, who want to build and who want to build to catalyze, you know, broader communities. It's not just about building buildings, it's about building neighborhoods and families within those buildings and within those neighborhoods. Um, how can we, you know, kind of advocate with these different agencies at the city, state, federal level, our cross sectors, arts organizations, and others to really advocate for affordable housing? I mean, that's what's messing with New York City. There's no more land. And so that's the challenge that the Bronx is facing right now. There's no land from here um, of the few vacant lands we have left. Because believe me, the ones that you see here are already, they've already been bought up. And it's just a matter of time before we kind of see what's coming. So how can we help, you know, through the general rezoning and other things? Like how can we help our communities, our artists in our communities to navigate that change? Because as we've all said, it's coming. And those are market forces that are kind of unhindered by legislation, by policies. Money talks, and that's what's really pushing the agenda now, so I really see the conversation as bigger than art. It's really about civic housing. engagement. It's all about understanding your electives, who your assembly people are, seeing who are, where are deals being made, how do you get in, how do you connect this information that you hear from the borough president's office and translate it to people that are living on your block. You know, it's the ugly evil of you have it, that it, you can't see it as evil. Civic engagement is a right, it's something that's active, and artists does it on one level. I mean, everybody does it on a certain level, but not doing it at all is just showing that, you know, it's the cop out. And I think many people have, I know life is, you know, <clears throat> life is life, you know, you have your day, daily operational grind, be it, you know, the baby or parks or whatever, you know? But the thing is, is like, if you as an individual don't engage and find out who the heck is your local board member or what your community board is, or who you, you know, who's your local community liaison to the borough president's office, then, you know, all this rezoning. I mean, I'm, in, I'm currently living in an area that 73 blocks are under rezoning. And that's a big, like, hello. So, you know, and what am I, what am I doing? You know, as a working artist, like I work, I do my art, but then I work and I engage and I find out what's happening. Like, what's happening to these schools? What's happening to this union? Who's the coalition involved? 
Like, what? there's always two sides to a story, and the best thing you could do is educate yourself to find out what they are for you to share that information or, you know, and collaborate and, and just figure out who are the people that you need to connect with. You know, all this change, um, it, it, it all depends where policy, people affect policy. And if people don't act, then things will happen not the way we want it to be. That's it. And I think we also need to manage our expectations. Yes. Because there are forces beyond our control. Correct. And so sometimes our communities don't get anything at all because we're kind of like all or nothing. Right. And at some point there has to be some way to meet. Sometimes it's not even halfway. But we have to, you know, we can't say it's just our way or the highway because right. it's going to happen without you. Right. So it's learning yeah. to understand that and learning to flex to try to work with it and see how your voice is still being heard throughout the changes that are going to be taking place. The Bronx is a very politically corrupt place. <laughs> As we've yeah. constantly seen, I mean, uh, just look at any of the history. You type a corrupt blocks politician and you have a list of people you could run through because there's so many of them. And the way I see it is that these people are our servants. And if you think that they're not doing right by the community, you get rid of them. You get people, you vote. That's how this happens. These people are here to serve us. If they're not serving us and they're serving themselves, which is exactly what's happening, you get rid of them. Because this is, this is truly, and here we are, we're in a, uh, an election year, we're always in an election year. But it's a matter of, you know what? Services are given to those who are voting. Why, why is there never a slow east side, lower, uh, Manhattan east side bus? Why? Because the old people that are waiting for that bus, as soon as that bus is late, they're calling people, why is my bus late? Because they are active in their community, they're constantly telling their, their elected officials they're not taking their crap, and that they're gonna do right by them. And that's why the East Side never has slow buses. And that is why the Bronx always has slow buses, because you know what? We have working people here who keep their heads down, who have to keep working day after day after day, and they're not interested in what's happening in how I need to get the larger community level. I need to pay my bills, I need to make sure my kids, just like Linda was saying. But with that head down, that is how change will happen to us and not for us. So that's when I get, you know what? There has to be, through elected officials, we need to get out of there what we need. And I hope we answered your question. <laughs> I'm sorry, there's a question back any there. Any more questions? Any, any more comments? Then I'd like to give my, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the panelists and my wife. Um, <laughs> and I want to have the last word. So, <laughs> so I'll carry our, our hostess here. Asian <laughs> this way is to be in communication mm -hmm. um, and come up with a plan so you know coalitions we have yeah. to have more coalitions and more plans that can actually speak to the elected official because it doesn't make any sense to go with something that's up you know it's not even you can't even consider it, it costs too much or it, it doesn't mean that where they are either so I think that there needs to be a <coughs> very um, pointed effort to come up with a plan so you can present something that actually has a chance of being considered. So I think the more we can have, you know, continuing uh, collaboration and communication across the board, I just get on the same page. And demonstrating that the arts is not the catalyst to... The arts is not the enemy. Right. It is not. I also think that uh, we in the Bronx need to uh, look at the other parts of the city that are going through gentrification and, and collaborate with those yeah. people. There, there's lots of organizations in Brooklyn that are doing what we are trying to do here in the South Bronx. And they've been doing it for a longer time than we have. And I feel like if those coalitions and those people could get together, you're talking about a larger force that has no choice but to listen to us. Thank you very much Thank for, you for listening to yeah. us. Yeah, actually, let's thank Bill Thank you. One last comment I will make is the best thing you can do for us is support your local artists. Yeah. 
support your local arts organization. Don't be they save twenty dollars admission. It's cheaper than going downtown. Do it. The more you spend on us, the more we can produce, and the more we're known. And the more we're known, they we are not we're not going to be pushed out. We are going to be the solution. Thank you. Thank you.